Good evening, everyone. I hope you're well and welcome to our webinar treatment for indigestion and bloating. My name is Morella and I'll be your host for this evening. Our expert presenter for this evening is consultant gastroenterologist, Dr. Hanuman Sadaraya. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so via the Q&A icon, which is on the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. If you do give your name, we will be able to follow up with your questions after the webinar if we haven't been able to answer your question during the webinar itself. If you would like to book a consultation, we have Chelsea Dan from the private patients team on hand to take any phone calls after the webinar and we'll provide the telephone number at the end of this session. Please note the webinar is being recorded. I'll hand over now to Dr. Hamimadvaraya and you'll hear from me again shortly. Um, thank you very much, uh, Morales, uh, for your uh, kind introduction. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Hanuman Taraya. I'm a consultant uh, gastroenterologist. Um, I've been working uh, at um, Benin Hospital for the last um, six years or so. I'm, um, I predominantly practice um, general uh, gastroenterology uh, here at Benin Hospital, but uh, some specialist interest in uh, liver, pancreas, and bile duct disease as well. So what I said uh, that uh, we will uh, briefly discuss about um, um, indigestion and its causes and uh, um, gastrosomal reflux and uh, um, briefly on uh, uh, bloating and its causes. And, and, and finally, uh, I would like to uh, touch upon uh, uh, some um, uh, myths and confusions around uh, the medications um, such as port and pump inhibitors which are used to treat uh, the indigestion and also um, the importance of um, a diet uh, in the management of uh, indigestion and bloating. And finally, we will give uh, time to ask questions. So indigestion is a very a common um, symptom. And uh, in my practice, um, about 40% of the patients I see, um, either they come with uh, symptoms of indigestion or are bloating. And in fact, about 20% of uh, general population uh, do suffer from uh, this uh, symptoms of uh, indigestion. But approximately about only 5% actually present to their GPs um, um, uh, for uh, help. The symptoms are very varied. Um, sometimes patient might be just having uh, burping and belching and some abdominal pains. But as such, uh, one should have at least a three months uh, symptoms of uh, upper abdominal pain and uh, fullness after eating and early satiety. And they are the typical symptoms of uh, indigestion. At many um, times, um, the symptoms of uh, gallbladder diseases, pancreas, and uh, some motility disorders with uh, the gut itself may overlap with the symptoms of uh, indigestion. Although majority of these patients are uh, um, benign conditions, but uh, you know, there's no doubt that indigestion and bloating uh, is, is a cause of uh, uh, psychological distress and poor quality of life. As I said earlier, I think that most of these patients are um, uh, benign conditions, and you would be surprised to uh, know that um, uh, cancers are actually identified only in about um, less than 2% of these patients. And um, the acid-related um, symptoms um, and diseases are um, seen in about 25% of the patients. Uh, that could be ulcers and um, severe inflammation in the gullet or helicobacter pylori-induced ulcers. I think approximately about 10% of the patients uh, do uh, suffer from um, sinister symptoms, uh, which needs uh, urgent investigations. And uh, those symptoms could be um, someone who has had uh, indigestion uh, for the first time in their life uh, after uh, 50 years of age. And um, if you had 
lost weight or and suffered uh, any um, difficulty in swallowing or vomiting. I think uh, those are the symptoms I think we should uh, consult uh, your uh, GP or uh, perhaps come out to us for investigations. Now, this is, um, this is the group of patients uh, we would really uh, would like to uh, help. And um, you, you have had your endoscopy, uh, but um, um, that was negative. Uh, but uh, what to do uh, you know, further? And you, you still having symptoms? And uh, you know, uh, we would like to really help these group of patients. Um, although most of these patients are functional in nature, uh, but there are uh, some um, uh, other diseases could be uh, causing the similar symptoms like uh, indigestion symptoms, such as um, motility disorders and more bladder issues and perhaps celiac disease. I think interestingly, um, I would like to really see in two ways uh, these group of patients uh, who had normal endoscopy uh, still having symptoms and, um, and associated with some sinister symptoms. And um, there is a clear evidence that approximately about six to seven percent of these patients might be having um, some uh, other cancers, uh, cancers of the pancreas, uh, bladder, or uh, perhaps uh, lymph node cancer. I think those patients really need uh, further uh, thorough investigations uh, to, uh, to rule out uh, any uh, cancers in, in, in those patients. And um, other group of patients, they might be still um, having um, um, symptoms of uh, gallbladder disease, and they certainly would like to know uh, uh, what's causing the symptoms and, you know, if possible, they want to get treated and get on with their life. If you have a mild symptoms, perhaps, you know, your GP might just uh, do a test for helicobacter pylori and treat you with um, antibiotics if you're positive and that might resolve your symptoms. And, or it might just simply give you um, some empirical uh, uh, treatment with acid suppression for about two to three weeks and, uh, and your symptoms might disappear. Uh, if you had any small uh, ulcer or uh, inflammation in the gullet. But you might also send you for an endoscopy as well. But I think if you have a severe or any sinister symptom, I think you should really uh, seek early help uh, because um, picking up any cancers at an early stage has a better prognosis. The most of the, uh, sim uh, the, 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 the indigestion uh, patients are actually uh, suffering from functional dyspepsia. Uh, this is uh, very common in patients who've got anxiety and, and, and depression. And um, it might be that there is a, a disordered uh, gut-brain um, axis, uh, the cause of uh, their symptoms. They're often quite difficult to treat these patients. But in my practice, what I've seen is that um, a meticulous uh, dietary uh, modifications and um, uh, would certainly help and also um, treat, uh, treating them with um, neuromodulators uh, to uh, calm down their gut-brain axis, such as uh, antidepressant, would certainly uh, help these patients. Now, um, the gastrointestinal reflux, you know, reflux is a, is a very uh, common thing and it's often quite physiological. And, um, but, you know, if you're really getting more frequently and and, and more often during the night time. And um, that is probably uh, is what is called as a gastroesophageal uh, reflux disorder. And, um, and you might be having a, a very typical symptoms of heartburn and regurgitation. And uh, others might be having atypical symptoms such as um, a wheeze and uh, some dry cough and a hoarseness of voice. Uh, majority of this um, mild uh, gastroesophageal reflux could be treated with uh, a course of um, medications. However, uh, there are a group of patients um, uh, who would be having uh, very refractory symptoms of uh, gastroesophageal reflux. And uh, the reason in them could be uh, due to 
um, insufficient acid suppression. Um, there's only about 25% of the patients would actually um, uh, you know, um, get rid of their symptoms um, by one style um, acid suppression medications. Um, maybe that uh, we need to optimize that treatment, increasing uh, the medications to twice daily uh, maximum doses uh, to treat their symptoms. And um, there are also other uh, conditions could be the cause of their uh, refractory gastrointestinal uh, reflux. And um, sometimes um, we see a lot of uh, younger patients, um, allergic individuals, um, presenting to us uh, similar symptoms like gastroesophageal reflux, um, but um, they might be having inflammation in the gullet due to uh, allergy mediated, not acid related. Those patients uh, typically need endoscopy and biopsies from the gullet to confirm this disease. And, uh, and as I said uh, earlier, I think uh, there could be other causes such as um, you know, motility disorders of the gullet or uh, motility disorders of uh, uh, stomach could be causing uh, uh, their refractory um, symptoms. I would say that um, everyone who has got um, worrisome reflux uh, benefit from having a gastroscopy. The reason behind that is that uh, if, if you know what we are dealing with, uh, we could actually uh, plan uh, your management better. For example, if you have a, a Barrett's esophagus, you probably need uh, uh, your uh, acid suppression medications uh, for, uh, for a lifetime. Uh, whereas if you have uh, uh, no um, structural damage, inflammation or ulcers, perhaps um, just take um, a short duration of uh, acid suppression medications uh, with the lowest dose possible. I think that most of the, the mild symptoms of gastric surgery reflux could be treated uh, just uh, by uh, lifestyle modifications and um, perhaps uh, taking uh, medications uh, as and when required. Um, some of the, uh, the lifestyle uh, modifications, such as um, elevating the edge of the bed and uh, providing some of the foods which uh, um, cause uh, uh, relaxation of the, uh, the, the lower esophageal sphincter uh, would uh, be useful, um, such as spicy food, chocolate, and fizzy drinks. Um, obviously, there's smoking and uh, heavy alcohol also implicated in the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, and, and avoiding these um, smoking and alcohol would certainly help them as well. But if you have uh, severe symptoms, I think you should see us. Uh, and uh, we can uh, investigate you um, thoroughly uh, to look for any damage to the gullet and also um, to pick up any other causes of uh, uh, symptoms mimicking like gastrointestinal reflux. And of course, um, um, severe and refractory symptoms of gastrointestinal reflux, um, there are um, surgical interventions uh, and also endo endoscopic uh, treatments are available. Now, I have to say that um, the, the proton pump inhibitors, uh, what we call it as lansoprazole or omeprazole, and these medications are uh, there uh, for the last um, 30, 40 years. And, and, and ever since I qualified and I've seen these medications are uh, wonderful drugs, uh, which um, saved lots of lives. And uh, in the past, when I mean, a patient presented with the uh, severe bleeding or ulcerations in the stomach, they would strike go to the, uh, the surgery. But uh, nowadays, we can successfully treat these patients uh, uh, with uh, proton pump inhibitors. And uh, to be very effective, these medications has to be taken uh, 30 minutes to one hour before uh, um, the first meal of the day. And uh, the reason is that um, the, the, the proton pumps uh, which secrete the acid are maximally expressed uh, when you're uh, in an empty stomach. And uh, the, the, the acid suppression medications are uh, more uh, helpful to block these pumps and um, decrease the acid secretion. And um, 
there are some safety concerns with the long-term usage of um, uh, proton pump inhibitors. And um, some side effects such as uh, infections, um, Clostridium difficile and Salmonella are quite common in, in, in these patients. And um, some other um, malabsorption um, of uh, magnesium and calcium and iron is also seen in patients. There are some um, concerns about um, long-term use of these medications recently, whether or not uh, they are associated with kidney disease. Um, I think that most of them are or, uh, the case reports, and uh, but um, very controversial. Uh, they probably need uh, more um, robust studies to confirm this, and, uh, and also um, dementia as well. Um, patients, um, studies conducted so far, uh, two studies, uh, they said um, long-term use of protein pump inhibitors is associated with um, um, memory loss, uh, but two other um, studies have uh, rejected this. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, if you need these medications, it is um, very helpful, and uh, but uh, they are being misused and um, they are being prescribed for um, unindicated, unindicated um, uh, diseases. I think that should uh, stop. When in hospital, um, we have a very dedicated endoscopy unit, and um, we can uh, offer you um, comprehensive uh, gastro uh, endoscopies, um, and surveillance, and taking biopsies and H. pollen tests, and uh, we can also um, investigate you uh, with all the radiological uh, investigations. And uh, there's also a um, 24 um, hour pH uh, monitoring uh, to confirm the acid reflux available here as well. And some of the tests are not available here, but uh, we could certainly outsource these, these tests to uh, the nearby hospitals. And uh, if further treatments, Required for your uh, refractory gastro, so we can put you in the uh, in the right hands uh, to get treated. Um, also, want to um, tell you that um, surgical intervention such as laparoscopic application is also available um, here at um, Benenden Hospital. Bloating is, uh, is, is, is again a quite uh, common symptoms, um, which is um, probably 30% um, of the general population suffer from bloating. And uh, it's more common in um, patients with functional uh, diseases such as uh, IBS and functional constipation. Patient typically present with uh, increased pressure, fullness, and um, symptoms of uh, gas trapping. It is um, not known why and uh, how um, one would get um, the symptoms of bloating. It is a quite a complex pathology. However, uh, some reasons such as increased uh, grass uh, production um, due to uh, um, complex and digestible carbohydrates in the gut uh, could be you know, the cause. And um, I think uh, there's a lot of um, um, evidence coming out uh, that a change in the gut microbiome could well be the cause of some of the functional uh, gut symptoms, such as bloating and indigestion. And um, somewhat uh, very common in uh, patients with stress and anxiety as well. There's certainly some organic causes which causes bloating as well, such as uh, celiac disease and uh, some uh, pancreatic enzyme deficiencies and uh, small intestinal bacterial uh, overgrowth. And very rarely, um, some cancers could be causing obstruction and gas trapping as well. And it's quite common in patients uh, who underwent uh, previous uh, fund application. 
uh, other uh, surgical procedures. Certainly, we would like to uh, investigate uh, for all these uh, um, organic causes and treatable causes to help you with. Um, So when to see a doctor when you have bloating? If you have um, diarrhea, bloody stools, and pale greasy stools, that could be due to some malabsorption, such as uh, celiac disease or uh, pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. I think you certainly need to see the doctors. And if you're experiencing severe abdominal pains, and um, unintended weight loss of uh, more than 5%, you should really see the doctors. And um, the treatment uh, is uh, mainly uh, very much individualized. If you have any uh, severe symptoms, then um, we would like to investigate you thoroughly uh, uh, to rule out any uh, treatable causes or any way of cancers. And um, if you uh, symptoms are predominantly due to uh, diet induced. I think you would probably benefit uh, from dietary intervention, uh, such as uh, a low fat diet, and uh, perhaps um, taking some uh, probiotic to regenerate a good bacteria in your gut. And um, if your symptoms of bloating are predominantly due to uh, psychological uh, issues, uh, you might benefit uh, from. Uh, some uh, neuromodulator medications and some behavioral therapy as well. So at Benenden Hospital, we can certainly uh, investigate you uh, for all the um, treatable organic causes. Um, and also we can offer um, a breath test uh, to diagnose uh, any possibility of a small intestinal bacteria uh, or growth. And um, we also have a dedicated dietitians uh, who could help you with um, uh, some exclusion diet and low format diets. And finally, um, you may have uh, heard about this um, low FODMAP diet. This was uh, posed by an Australian uh, researchers more than a decade ago. It's quite uh, popular um, among the world um, and uh, it is uh, quite intense and uh, boring uh, as well. And um, these are the, um, the, the foods with the high FODMAPs that you should be really avoiding. Um, and um, I've listed here some, um, some foods um, which would help you. These are a low FODMAP diet. Obviously, I think um, we would not recommend our patients to practice um, low FODMAP diet on their own. Uh, there is an uh, increasing chance of uh, fallout uh, from uh, the program uh, because it is uh, it's quite uh, intense and boring. And also some patients uh, tend to develop uh, some uh, nutritional deficiencies adhering strictly to this. So I would advise that if you are intending to practice low for diet, I think you should see a dietitian to get help. They can actually advise you on uh, uh, exclusion of the diet and then um, uh, reintroduction of uh, the FODMAPs and they can uh, desire you a modified uh, low FODMAP diet, which suits you better. That's it. Thank you very much. Many thanks for that. Um, now we'll take some questions that have been answered, um, that have been asked, sorry. Um, so if I start with the first one, um, I'm 34 and suffer quite badly with bloating, particularly after eating. I have tried changing my diet and not drinking fizzy drinks. It is uncomfortable, but not painful. Should I still get this checked? Um, I think, uh, yes. Um, um, I would suggest that uh, at least we should do some basic investigations in your case uh, to rule out uh, some uh, uh, malabsorption conditions. And, um, and, and once uh, they are ruled out, and if you don't have any uh, worrying symptoms, I think uh, perhaps you should really see a, a dietitian for a dedicated uh, 
um, dietary modification. Thank you. Um, next question. I recently saw my doctor about my regular stomach pain and discomfort after eating. They suggested a gastroscopy, but I am worried about this. Would I be awake for this and would I need to stay overnight in hospital? Uh, um, I think um, it is um, not a painful uh, procedure, uh, the gastroscopy. And um, we can uh, give you a sedation and uh, um, that sedation would not necessarily uh, just knock you out during the procedure, um, but uh, it will keep you comfortable. The procedure itself, it takes about 10 minutes to do. And, uh, and most of the patients are, you know, um, could go home, <coughs> excuse me, um, an hour after the procedure. And, uh, and we don't normally keep the patients in the hospitals after the procedure. Thank you. Um, next question. I'm quite an active person and cycle to work most days. My GP suggested exercise can help bloating, but after eating breakfast, I feel so bloated that I don't enjoy cycling. Should I avoid exercise so soon after eating? I think, I think you should uh, try and take uh, a light uh, exercise, perhaps uh, uh, a casual uh, walk uh, after uh, after uh, after your dinner or after lunch, uh, and certainly I wouldn't uh, advise you um, cycling, which is probably can cause a more discomfort uh, in your tummy. Uh, and 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 I would be interested to know um, what kind of investigations you had uh, so far. And um, occasionally, I think um, there might be, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there might be some issues with uh, motility disorders, and it's worth checking uh, to make sure that. Uh, uh, your, your gut is actually working uh, well. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, I don't suffer bloating pains, but I feel that my tummy rumbles and makes noises so regularly that it can be embarrassing. It even makes noises when I'm not hungry at all. Should I see a gastroenterologist? Sorry, didn't pronounce that correctly. And. <laughs> um, Again, I think, uh, you know, this is um, the most of the patients, um, it is just uh, the perception that, uh, you know, there is a um, uh, the content uh, in their uh, uh, gastrointestinal tract uh, is, is quite a lot and uh, the, they're producing a lot of gas. This is actually just a, a false perception. Um, but yes, uh, I think um, there might be the reason that it, you are probably eating a lot of uh, um, complex carbohydrates, which is drawing a lot of water into your gut as well. And, and perhaps I think, you know, you would certainly benefit from uh, some uh, dietary modifications such as low FODMAP diet to decrease the osmotic load in your, in your gut. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, I struggle to sleep at night due to acid reflux and sometimes wake up because of it. I have stopped drinking tea and sleep more upright. Are there any other solutions I can try? Well, um, certainly, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned uh, in my talk, I think, um, you know, uh, elevating the edge of the bed at least uh, six to eight inches uh, would uh, help you. And um, um, I think um, you might be having inadequate uh, acid suppression. And uh, I think it would be useful that, uh, you know, if you could you know, uh, swap your, uh, or you can, if you could take uh, an extra um, uh, acid suppression medication um, an hour before uh, your uh, evening meal certainly would help some of the patients. Thank you. Um, next question. I suffer quite badly with heartburn and bloating after eating. I have tried changing my diet. Are there any natural <clears throat> remedies I can try before resorting to an endoscopy? I think the, the, we have um, advised patients uh, to take uh, peppermint oil capsules, which are uh, quite good. And uh, um, some patients um, would benefit from charcoal tablets as well. And um, I think there's a lot of information on um, uh, the natural, uh, national natural website, uh, medicines website as well. You could have a look at that. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, 
what does modulation of brain gut axis mean? Now, uh, I think that's a good question. Uh, and, and basically, um, like um, any part of our uh, body, uh, our gut is heavily innervated uh, with uh, the nerve endings. And um, in some patients, especially um, patients who are very anxious, um, these nerve endings get uh, quite irritated. And, uh, and, uh, and this is um, sensed very easily by our gut and our brain as well. Uh, and, and, and so modulating uh, this, um, uh, what we call as a visceral hypersensitivity or uh, irritation uh, using some of the low-dose antidepressant is clearly uh, shown to be benefit in those patients with a, a disordered gut-brain axis. Um, last question. Um, is chicory root fibre good or bad for a FODMAP diet? I really don't know about that. And uh, I think, you know, we'll probably ask our dietitian and I will, uh, we'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, so thank you for everybody that asked the questions. Um, if you've provided your name, we will do, um, we'll be up be able to answer any other questions after the webinar. Um, if you'd like to book your consultation, please contact us on the number on your screen for eight o'clock tonight or between eight and 6 p.m. Monday to Friday. You'll receive a short survey and we would be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback on today's webinar. Our next webinar is on 30th of June with consultant gynaecologists Rowan Connell and Anna Zakarayan, who will be discussing the Mona Lisa touch and female health services, including HRT and menopause. So on behalf of Dr. Hanu Mathuraya, myself and the team at Benenden Hospital, I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to you joining us again on another webinar very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.